some great vintage race cars. We're here at the Georgia Racing Hall of Fame in Dawsonville to see how we harness electricity and magnetism to get where we want to go. We're looking at generators and motors in this segment of Physics in Motion. You may not have known, but generators and motors are not the same thing. We're going to use this vintage car to help explain the difference. Let's look under the hood. We're first of all interested in the generator, which is right here. It takes mechanical energy from the engine and turns it into electricity to run the lights and wipers and all the electrical systems in the car. A motor works the opposite way. It takes electrical energy and turns it into mechanical energy. So motors and generators are the reverse of each other. We'll get into more detail on all this a little later. But first, let me explain the difference between a motor and an engine, because many of us use those terms interchangeably. Technically, an engine runs on fuel, like gasoline. Motors, on the other hand, use electromagnetic induction. So if it needs chemical fuel, it's an engine. If it doesn't, and it runs on electricity, it's a motor, whether it's your electric toothbrush or a Model S Tesla. So now let's talk about how most cars, electric cars accepted, use generators and motors. It might be a little different than you think. Before about 1960, most cars used generators to drive the electrical system and gas to run the engine. Most modern cars use an alternator, which is a slightly different kind of generator for the electrical systems. But motors and generators both use electromagnetic induction, in which voltage is induced by a changing magnetic field. Okay, so you know that electricity can generate a magnetic field, and vice versa. But what you may not know is that this discovery, hundreds of years ago, led to figuring out how to build a car, and it starts with a man named Michael Faraday. He's the guy who invented the generator, which changed just about everything having to do with machines and how they work. Today, he's considered one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. One of his many legacies is called Faraday's Law. It predicts how a magnetic field will interact with an electric circuit to produce an electromotive force, or EMF. This interaction results in the phenomenon we call electromagnetic induction, which creates a current in a circuit when there is relative motion between the wire and the magnetic field. I'll show you in a simple demo. When I put this magnet through this wire loop, the changing magnetic field creates a current in the wire. You can see it here on the voltmeter. It induces a voltage, and that difference in potential causes current to flow. You can also see how electric current induces magnetism with this wire, nail, and battery. Normally, this nail is not a magnet. But when it's wrapped in a coil of wire, and I cause the current to flow by attaching it to a six volt battery, it becomes a temporary magnet. Now let's get into more of the guts of motors and generators. We'll start with motors. The most basic type of motor is a DC or direct current motor. Direct current is electrical current that runs in only one direction. Current travels from a battery and moves through wires called brushes, because in the old days they actually were brushes. Today, there are also brushless motors, which use digital sensors to perform the same task. The brushes sit on a piece of metal called a commutator. The commutator is a split ring, usually made of copper, that is connected to wire loops known as the armature. The commutator armature assembly is known as the rotor, which rotates at the center of the motor. The brushes, or sensors, are connected to the battery and make contact with the commutator as it turns, supplying it and the armature with current. This assembly sits in a stationary magnetic field that is created by the stator, made of either a permanent magnet or coil-wrapped metal plates that surround the rotor. The field exerts a magnetic force on the wires, which causes the rotor to turn. When the rotor has made half a turn, the current begins to flow in the opposite direction because the commutator is now touching the opposite side of the battery. This electromechanical process, by which direct current is turned into alternating current, 
is known as commutation. That reversal of current causes the magnetic force acting on the rotor to reverse direction. When it reverses, it makes the rotor spin. That motion, that mechanical energy, can turn a shaft, which is connected to many things to make them run. Your house probably has at least 50 motors in it, running everything from power tools and fans to household appliances and electric cars. There's another type of motor, an induction motor, that runs directly off alternating current. Compared to DC motors, induction motors are simpler and have fewer parts, no brushes and no commutator, which makes them more reliable and longer lasting. While induction motors run on alternating current, DC motors run off direct current and are used whenever the motor is battery operated. This is the stator, which in this kind of motor is made of laminated magnetic metal plates. It doesn't move, it's stationary just like in the DC motor. Copper or other metal is wound through to form a coil. Sometimes we call them windings. The more loops the windings have, the greater the magnetic field is through them. When you hook up the alternating current to the stator, the changing nature of the current flow creates a rotating magnetic field around it. The stator doesn't move, just the field around it. Like DC motors, induction motors have a rotor at the center made of copper wires. Remember, Faraday's law tells us that the changing magnetic field created by the stator induces voltage in the rotor. And because of that induced voltage, the rotor, located at the center of the motor, becomes a current-carrying loop. The changing magnetic field around the stator exerts a magnetic force on the current-carrying rotor which causes it to rotate. As the magnetic field moves around the rotor, it exerts a force in just the right place to cause the rotor to continue to rotate. That's what causes the rotor to spin continually, exerting a force on the wires at just the right time to create optimal power. We've seen that electricity and magnetism are intrinsically related. Alternating current flowing through the wire in the stator creates a changing magnetic field and conversely, current flows in the wires of the rotor because of this magnetic field. All motors function in much the same way, in that they all need changing magnetic fields to create motion within the rotor. The fundamental difference between induction and DC motors is that the changing magnetic fields in an induction motor are caused by the alternating current that is supplied to the stator. In a DC motor, the changing magnetic field is caused by commutation, which as you recall, is the mechanical transformation of the direct current from the battery to alternating current through the brushes and commutator bars on the armature that make up the rotor. Let's step back a second and think how we could make this motor even more powerful. Let's use the equation that allows us to find the magnetic force exerted on a current carrying wire, where magnetic force equals current times the length of the wire times the magnetic field strength. We could make the magnetic field stronger, or we could increase the length of the wire, or we could add more charge and increase current. Of all these options, the easiest one is to increase the length of the wire. We do this by stacking loops of wire on top of each other in the coil that we've talked about. Each loop contains moving charge that experiences a magnetic force. The more loops, the stronger the net force of the rotor, and so the more powerful the motor. Now that we've seen how motors work, let's take a look at how generators work opposite the way motors do. They take mechanical energy and turn it into electrical energy. This is a generator. It's found in classic cars built before 1964. Just like certain types of motors, it has a rotor made of an armature and a commutator that are in contact with brushes and an electromagnetic stator that surrounds the rotor. The difference is the armature rotates through mechanical action provided by the engine, being linked to it through a pulley. There's a residual magnetic field within the stator that provides the initial push to start current flowing through the armature as it rotates. Some of the current produced by the moving armature flows to the stator, strengthening the magnetic field and increasing output. 
In this car, the excess current from the armature is used to power things like headlights and turn signals, as well as charge the car's battery. There are many different kinds of generators, but they all follow the same principle, taking mechanical energy and turning it into electrical energy. So question, between motors and generators, which one do you think supplies electricity to your home? That would be a generator. So a power plant consists of an electrical generator. Something has to spin the rotor within that generator. It might be a water wheel in a hydroelectric dam, a large diesel engine, or a gas turbine. But in most cases, the thing spinning the rotor is a steam turbine. The steam might be created by burning coal, oil, or natural gas, which heat the water to create the steam. Or the steam may also come from the heat generated by a nuclear reactor. And the electricity that results is in the form of an alternating current. Alternating current, or AC, is current that reverses direction multiple times per second. In the United States, that happens 60 times per second, or 60 hertz. AC power uses high voltage to move the electricity long distances. During transport, the voltage is so high that it's too dangerous to use in residential or even commercial use. A power plant creates electricity that can be stepped up or increased to as much as 500,000 volts. But by the time it gets to your house or business, it's either 240 or 120 volts. How do they do that? Companies use transformers to lower the voltage to a manageable level. By the time it gets to you, the voltage has been stepped down by transformers several times so that you can safely run all the electrical devices around you. We've talked about the difference between generators and motors, how they mirror each other in some ways, but both supply us with the energy we need to power our world. And we saw some really great cars while we were here. That's it for this segment of Physics in Motion. We'll see you guys next time. For more practice problems, lab activities, and note-taking guides, check out the Physics in Motion Toolkit.